Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are here in sunny New Jersey. This is Susan Lawton, and we were lucky enough to be able to get Jan Jeremias from her busy, busy schedule to come and share some of her wonderful experience with pets and essential oils. And I feel very privileged and honored that Jan is making this time for us. And she's providing this first lesson for us, for us to get acquainted with the essential oils and our pets. And Jan, we already have some questions. So when you're ready for the question part, let me know. And folks, this is Jan Jeremias, and she's going to tell you about her own background, because I would just go on too long. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Sue. Um, so welcome, everybody, and thank you for being on. Uh, my background is in actually human health, and um, I always say that I, everybody comes to essential oils in their own way. And I actually came in via the animal route. Um, that's how I started. I started with my dog who had Alzheimer's at the time, and I decided I wanted to help her, you know, naturally and help her to live a more comfortable and healthy life as she aged. And when the essential oils worked on her, um, I then sort of started using them on myself, which is usually, I know a lot of people actually where it happens in reverse. But um, that's how I came in, and that was a very long time ago. That was about 14 years ago, and I've been using essential oils on animals ever since. That is really cool. What did the frankincense do for your puppy that was forgetting? Um, it helped her be more focused. Um, you know, I used a lot of essential oils at the time, you know, a number of essential oils, but the frankincense I found really helped her focus and helped her anxiety because one of the things that um, older dogs um, become very anxious because they become disoriented and they don't know where they are. So helping them relieve some of that anxiety helps them to just function better. Wow. Okay. And I know you're going to talk to us about how to use it. So I'll go, go ahead. Okay, I'll go through all the different ways. But in general, I think we all love our pets and want to take care of them. And we can be, you know, pet parents or animal parents or animal caretakers. Or we can be in the business of working with animals, either through shelters or groomers or veterinarians or vet techs. And I think that what brings us all together and what connects us all is that um, we want to better help animals um, to live um, a more healthy life. Oh, um, that's for sure. They're really a member of our family, Jan. Oh, they so are. They are children, and I always say that, you know, I don't have human children. I have animal children, and they're just as important to me, <laughs> I ah. think, as my, friends, as my friends who have regular children. You that's know, right. they... You are absolutely right. So basically, you know, the next slide um, shows that essential oils, pretty much the same way you would use essential oils on yourself if you use them, um, you will use them on your pets um, with slight um, modifications, but really not that many. Um, basically, you, you know, you can diffuse essential oils in the air. You can apply them topically to your pet. And you might, um, in some cases, um, mostly for dogs, I don't um, recommend that much internal use in cats, you might eat, um, give your dog um, essential oils internally. So basically, you know, it's the same as using them for yourself. There's really no difference at all. Um, and I love that. And that was one of the things that I loved about using essential oils from way in the beginning was the fact that I could use the same things I was using on myself on my dogs and cats and vice versa what I was using on them I could use on myself and I just think it made me feel more comfortable I think the quality became very important because obviously if I was using them on everyone in my household then I was going to make sure they were of the utmost purity and um, the highest quality essential oils I could I could get okay now you know that I show people how to do aroma touch on animals and oh, I, yeah, we do we teach that all the time. And the difference is we start at the back of the head and go down to the tail on 
all four legged animals when we're doing aroma touch because it has to do with the trust factor. And I know when uh -huh. you were working with the animals, you were telling me that you apply it by putting it on your hands. And then what do you do with it? Same thing. I tend to start at the head and work my way down the torso. Um, I, I mean, I know there are a lot of people out there that will put oils on paws. But I have to say that my one full, the one thing I am probably uh, most focused on when I speak to people or I guide people is that you always want the experience with your animal or anyone for that matter to be a positive experience. And so when I'm putting oils on my dog, I put it where he likes to be touched because I want him, I want that connection, I want to make sure that the experience is positive. And so for people who say that they, you know, do you put oils on your dog's paws, my dog hates to have his paws touched, like he hates it. And so I don't put oils there. I mean, I don't really, I don't really think you need to put them on the paws, but if, you know, if your dog loves to have his paws touched, then I guess that's fine, but torso is really good. And anywhere on the torso, I tend to work down from the ears. I go down the back of the body all the way to like the hips and the pelvis right above the tail. Um, sometimes I go down the front, depending on what's going on and, you know, if it's a particular issue. Um, I want to be clear that, you know, there's no reason why you can't dilute the oils. I actually think that it's actually kind of nice. It's always better to have to have that feeling and to be able to go along the length of the body and know that you're, I don't know, there's some sort of um, moisture or lubrication. Not that you have to have a lot of a carrier oil or a large dilution. And then the other thing is that most um, fatty oils like coconut oil or fractionated coconut oil is really good for their fur. So it has a double benefit of being really, really beneficial to the oh, skin. No. And to the that, fur. I hadn't even thought of that. That's a great idea. Yeah, I have a few. I have a client of mine who's a groomer who loves the fractionated coconut oil. I mean, she thinks it's the greatest thing. She said all her like clients or all her dogs that you know she uses it on them all the time. Great. Can I please ask you about which oils? Like uh, friends of mine have puppies and they get kind of rambunctious. What would you mm -hmm. use in the puppy room besides keeping the air clean to maybe help them calm down? I like, um, I like lavender a lot. I think lavender is always a really good staple and it's good for so many, so many different things. And then there are a few blends like one that contains lavender and marjoram and chamomile. Um, that's really, really nice, or something that's a little bit more grounding. Um, the one thing I have to say about applying and using oils around animals is remember how, um, how refined their sense of smell is. Right. So, you know, I was reading the other day that we have 5 million smell cells in our nasal cavity. Cats have 19 million, and dogs have 200 million smell cells. Wow. So you have to think to yourself that when you're applying an essential oil, that's another good reason to dilute, but when you're applying an essential oil to your pet, you know, don't put the oil directly underneath their nose. Don't, don't open. I mean, people are like, oh, I want to know if my pet likes this oil, so they'll put the bottle right up against the dog's oh, nose. No, no, no. And don't do that because can you imagine smelling something with like 200 million smell cells? Like the poor thing is probably so overwhelmed. <laughs> wow. Wow. No, I just, you know, I'm always very gentle around animals, especially around their face and their eyes. Everything to me just always seemed very, very sensitive. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Behind the head. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, behind the head, on the back, not directly underneath the nose. You know, it's a, it's a really, um, it's just it's a gentler, kinder way and positive way. And so one of the things I know that everybody likes to do is to diffuse. And um, I love diffusing around my pets. 
um, I'll give you a few little um, recommendations and a few little um, helpful hints when diffusing for your pets. I'm ready. One is like, um, when you diffuse, there are, you know, a, if you're new to essential oils, there, and even if you're um, more experienced essential oil user, there are two types of diffusers, the water diffuser and the nebulizer diffuser. I really like water diffusers around pets, around animals, um, dogs and cats and other animals. One is because you really get to precisely measure how much oil you get to put in the water, which I think is a really good thing to do, especially um, if you're diffusing a new combination or if you're new to diffusing around your animals. I think it's just, you might as well start small, as in the oil world, we always say less is more. Right. So less oil in the diffuser might be a better option in the beginning than putting, you know, in a water diffuser, putting 10 or 15 drops and overwhelming your pet. Um, when diffusing for the first time, or even, this is for anything, but I say it a lot in diffusing because usually um, people just don't put on oils and leave. But don't put the diffuser on and then decide you're going out for the day especially if it's the first time, like make sure your pet's okay, um, you know, they're not, you know, their eyes aren't tearing or they're not excessively sneezing, not that you're doing any permanent damage, but they're, you know, this way you know that maybe it's a little bit too strong for them and maybe you air out the room or you add more water to the diffuser. Um, my, my animals really don't, um, dislike almost any combination I make, but I always say that, you know, one of my rules of thumb, my animals always hang out where I hang out. That's just the way, um, you know, if I'm in the room, they're in the room. And so one of my rules of thumb is if they leave the room when I put on the diffuser, it's usually a sign that they don't like it. You know, it's okay, mom, this combination just doesn't work for us. Especially yeah. if they go running out of the room howling. That's right. That's right. If they go zooming out of the room. Very rarely does that happen. And I have combinations that they absolutely love. But um, cats actually love peppermint. I know that um, catnip is a mint. So um, cats love peppermint. I don't usually diffuse straight peppermint, but peppermint in combination with other oils are, are really nice. What about, um, spearmint? have you tried spearmint, or is that too sharp? No, I haven't tried spearmint, but that's a good, I, I mean, I would be, I've used, well, I, I've used spearmint with dogs, because spearmint, um, I have found that with dogs that have, um, with animals in general that have lost their appetite for some reason, um, a lot of times that's due to the fact that they can't smell the food. And if an animal can't smell the food, they're not going to eat. So okay. sometimes if you can open up their air pad, their nasal passages, and you can help them breathe and smell better, they eat better. So some of the mints actually help if you have an animal that all of a sudden has lost its appetite. Um, there are other reasons animals can lose their appetite, but that I find that that does help. Wow. Okay. I had no idea. And so um, topical application. Um, we went through it a little bit, but you can apply essential oils to your pet by petting them. Um, put, you can use straight oil, putting one or two drops, um, letting most of the oil absorb onto your hands and then petting them. As you notice in the picture, um, the individual is starting from the head of the cat and working its way, you know, and they're doing the bellies of the dog. Um, pretty much an essential oil is going to go where it needs to go. So if you have a animal with a digestive problem, it's not feeling well, you know, and you think that their stomach is bothering them or something, you can take a little bit of essential oils and try to get down low somewhere around the front. But if they won't let you touch them there, then don't worry about that. Just put the oil on because the oil is going to go um, and help nowhere, no matter where it's applied. Um, my um, a few things about putting oils um, on animals is you have to be smart and you have to remember that um, you have to be sometimes you really if it's an ongoing issue that you're putting oils on this animal every single day for something or even just for just normal health maintenance 
I do not sort of, I take my oil bottles out. They're already prepared. They're there. I'm not like finding my animal and then or finding my cat and then trying to find my oil because if I fidget around too much, my cats will go. And I don't want to obviously chase them around the house trying to put oils on them because they are not going to be happy. <laughs> so, yeah, no. And so I tell people, be prepared. Like, have the oil bottle out. You know, find the animal. Put a little bit on your hand before you even go over. You know, sort of get it a little bit rubbed in. They're sort of getting the waft of getting it. You know, the oil's in the air and around them and surrounded by them. The other thing I find is that... Um, find um, ways to make it an enticing experience on all levels. Like some people treat their animals, like give their animals treats after they apply oils. I mean, especially with animals that are very food motivated, there's nothing wrong with like, you know, I'll apply oils to the, you know, to my dog and then give them a treat afterwards, you know. Um, the other thing is that if your animals are food oriented, my animals are because um, my animals eat at scheduled times. So any other time that they are food around, or I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to give a treat, they're going to be there. But during food time, that means that they're out and they're ready to eat. And I put oils on my cats all the time when they're eating because literally they could care less what I do to them as long as the food bowl's in front of them. They are gonna like they're gonna stay, and it's a great time because if they're not moving. You know, I take advantage of that. But sometimes you've got to be fast. And, you know, what I like to call you have to do like a drive-by petting. Where you put it on your hand and you are down the length of their body and they're gone. But sometimes you got to do that because they are quick little creatures. Right. And one thing you mentioned to me the other day was that it wasn't necessarily in your dog's best interest to have food out all day. And I didn't know that people did that. Yeah, some people think that, you know, oh, I don't, I'm not quite sure why, I have never done it, but a lot of animal owners, dog and cat owners, feel like there should be food readily accessible to their pet all the time. And I'm not a huge advocate of that, just because, just like in people, um, dog and cat obesity is a, on the rise, and so that's linked to a number of health conditions in animals too, things like arthritis and diabetes, just like in humans. And then the other thing is that in the wild, they don't eat all the time. I mean, in the wild, actually, um, wild cats eat like twice a week. So, yeah, or three times a week. They, you know, and what they, you know, so they don't eat all the time. And so I've always learned that it's much better for your animals if you sort of schedule the time. They eat in the morning, they eat in the evening, and then that's it. And then I feed my animals raw food. And so raw food is not depending on what you what you get, a lot of times can't be can't sit out at room temperature for any great length of time. So the food sits out for twenty minutes and then if they don't eat it it gets put away because otherwise it'll spoil. So but it's okay to leave water out. Oh yeah, I leave water out. Water's out all the time and should be readily available um, you know, to animals. Now one of the greatest ways I find to to get oils um, in a cat's environment is um, via the litter box. And in the really? book, we go through, we, we describe litter box power, it's called. And the way we do that is you um, have a clean litter box with whatever you're using. I use a corn-based um, litter. Um, and I mix about four drops of an essential oil and a cup of baking soda. And I let that sit overnight and then I take a tablespoon and I put it in the litter box every day when I clean the litter box and what it does is that when they kick up and they dig in that litter box they're getting the um, essential oils or the baking soda onto their paws they're also sort of mixing it up a little bit so that the um, aroma goes the aromatic molecules go into the air around them in the litter box and this has been really beneficial for cats that say with severe stress and anxiety. You know, putting a, like a lavender or some sort of blend that contains lavender, you know, and chamomile and marjoram is really, or a grounding blend is really beneficial to them, let's say if they have stress and anxiety issues or something like obsessive compulsive disorder where they have like, you know, cats that chronically groom themselves. Um, 
or um, sometimes for some sort of you know bladder and urinary tract problems, I'll recommend people put juniper berry in the baking soda and put that in the litter box. And especially if your cat is resistant to having oils applied to them, it's very, it's really very powerful, and it's not intrusive to them. You know, you're not actually, you know, you're not actually putting it on them, and so they tend to be a little bit more, um, you know, tolerant of that. Can My, you give us the, the recipe one more time? Sure. It's, it's a cup of baking soda and or cornstarch and um, about four drops of essential oil. Okay, so the juniper berry will be four drops if there was kidney or bladder issues. Right, and then calming blend, it would be the same. You could do four, to, four drops of lavender or calming blend. Um, if you have a cat with digestive issues, you could do some sort of digestive blend or combination um, that contains, you know, peppermint and fennel and anise and use four drops of that. I use, that's what I use in the litter box because it's also really good for hairballs. Oh, and right, the, hairballs. Yeah, those little things, those little presents that our cats leave us. So, <laughs> yeah, which um, which is bad. not to say that you shouldn't brush because you definitely need to brush, but it does help manage some of those, um, you know, hairballs. So I really like those combinations um, or one, one of them. You don't need to do all. My one suggestion is that when you're doing it for the first time, um, Offer two litter boxes, one that has essential oils and one that does not. Because the last thing you want is for your animals to avoid the litter box because they don't like the smell. And since you want them to use a litter box, even if it's That's not the essential oil one, good plan. You know, you leave them, leave both out, and don't put them near each other because the odor is so. You know, sometimes essential oils are so are quite potent, even though you're only using a tablespoon. But their sense of smell is so much better than yours. You know, maybe put it in a different room or put it on opposite sides of the room. Um, my cats adjusted very quickly; like they didn't have a problem at all. But I wasn't going to take the chance that they were going to um, go to the bathroom on the floor. Good, good. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So. So essential oils are great at maintaining good health, but nothing is the substitute for a good diet. Um, I'm a huge advocate of supplements and um, probiotics in animals, just like people. Um, my favorite oil for um, applying, um, I, you know, to apply daily is frankincense because I think it's gentle. It's been used since the beginning, you know, since for millions of years. Um, it's so beneficial from, for any aged animal, from, you know, kittens and puppies to really older animals. So to me, it's a really safe, if you don't know what other oil to put on your pet because you're not, you're new to essential oils, apply frankincense. Um, if you wanted to add a little lemon essential oil to food, if there are no cats in the home, because I really, like I said, don't really recommend um, cats ingesting essential oils. Um, you could add a little bit of lemon oil to the food. Um, good support to the immune system and good detoxifier. So really nice. Um, you have to monitor and just make sure that you know their taste is also very sensitive, that they're going to like it. And I would say don't aggravate them by trying to get them to have it. And then lastly is to diffuse. And that's, you know, whatever combination you really like and you really, you know, and whether they have some sort of ongoing health issue or you're just trying to maintain behavior, like good behavior. So that might vary, you know, depending on what you like and what's going on with your animals. Right on. Okay. Is this a good time to ask you a couple of questions people wrote in? Oh, sure. Okay, we have a lady who said, I have an almost 15-year-old, it must be a Weimariner, so uh -huh, I appreciate info on helping the older senior pet. What's best to diffuse? Um, to diffuse, I would do um, frankincense and lavender. I like the combination. Um, I think it's really great. Um, I don't know whether the animal, if it's just general health, um, I think frankincense and lavender is a really good combination if they had a specific issue. Um, 
then I might, you know, recommend something. But frankincense is such a good oil, and lavender is so calming and so multi -pur um, multi -pur purposeful. <laughs> Took me a minute to get that out. Um, right. Has so many multiple uses, I should say, that um, I love the that combination. Um, and then I might, all, you know, I like to mix up the oils sometimes. So something like um, cedarwood and lavender is nice. Um, I think those combinations are, are really good. And then, you know, depending on older pets are special. You know, I started there. Um, my dog lived to 19, which is obviously old for, really old for a dog. It sure is. Yeah. And you know, I think you just have to start to adjust your life. You know, it's the kind of thing where you have to sometimes deal, deal with hearing loss and vision loss. But the gift of pets and animals is that they adjust really well. Like that's, it's amazing to me, like, you know, animals that are visually impaired will walk around a room and navigate and learn where the furniture is supposedly within like less than 10 minutes. And so you it's, should it's, move the furniture around a lot if we have an older dog? <laughs> no, probably not. Like, don't go decide that you, you know, you need to relocate it. And if you do, just actually give them a chance to adjust. I mean, they'll adjust quite quickly, but actually walk them through the room and the perimeter just so they learn where everything is. I mean, they'll learn. So um, I hope that answered the question. Yes. And tell me, another lady wrote in and said, is it a good idea for the litter boxes to have lids? Oh, I, I think that's a personal. Mine has a lid. I think that's fine. I, I mean, even if you put in the baking soda, I mean, I think it's a nice, you know, I mean, I think it's more of an owner preference, personally, and an animal preference. I mean, my cats have never minded litter boxes with lids, and I actually like them because I think that they're a little bit cleaner. They tend to keep the litter in a little bit better, and I think it's fine for the pet. I mean, my one advice is if you are buying litter, is don't buy scented litter, even if you're not using essential oils in the litter box. I mean, scented litter has been linked to a number of negative health um, conditions in cats now. Um, increased incidences of cancer and everything, I think because of the artificial fragrances they're using in the litter, you know, in the odor for the litter boxes. So even if you don't use oils, use unscented litter. And I, like I said, I use a corn-based litter, but I know people who use like newspaper, you know, like they make ones that are made out of newspaper or other sort of natural substances. And those I think are the safest of the litters to use, um, even the, you know, the scoopable litters to use. Okay. Back to dogs and cats body parts. When applying oils, other than the face, the nose that you talked about, don't put oils there. Are there other areas of the body we should avoid? Yeah, don't put oils in the um, in the eyes, and never um, like people don't drip oils in the ears. Um, there are a number of recipes where we actually have like an ear cleaning recipe, and we have like a you know just because dogs' ears tend to, you know, there are dogs that are prone to ear infections, and there, but there are safe ways to use oils around the ear, like on the backs and on the flaps, but not directly in the ear. Okay. Yeah, that's in your book, and you have beautiful pictures to show people how to do that. And we're going to tell them in a minute how to get your book, because I have vets who have been very enlightened when I've taken your book to them. They're most oh. grateful. Okay, two more quick questions. Do we have time, do you think? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Um, we have a pregnant cat ready to give birth soon. Any suggestions to aid in delivery? Um, my uh, Probably I would um, go with um, lavender and myrrh. Myrrh is one of my favorite oils for... Um, infection control especially in cats okay I think it's it's a really gentle oil okay. and I think that um, tends to help um, prevent infection so I think diffusing I think you can diffuse anything that's calming and um, going to help the cat feel more comfortable you know and that could be and I always say that um, remember um, what you feel affects your, and how you are affects your animal. You know, sure. my um, 
one of my train my dog trainer always says he's a dog behaviorist he always says remember that the leash is just an external umbilical cord so even if you have a cat remember that what you feel and what your energy is your cat or your dog will pick up on that energy okay. so in a situation like that I would say remember to put oils on yourself <laughs> right on <laughs> and remember that if you're calmer they're going to be calmer right. you know in any situation oh, up and up and down with excitement and oh my god what is this they're going to go crazy too that's right that's right okay then we have a question on a springer spaniel mm -hmm. all of a sudden is losing its fur is there an oil oh. that could help with restoring fur growth yeah, I think it, it, there is, and it really depends on why the dog is losing its fur. A lot of times, I mean, if it you know if it's allergy based, um, first thing I would look at though on a non oil on not an uh, on a non oil sort of way is diet because diet is a huge contributing factor to dogs losing and that infection but diet can definitely cause hair loss if it's allergy based and so I would say just if, if, if they haven't changed their diet then you know that's different but if they recently did a diet change and sometimes even if they're feeding the same food what happens is that companies actually change the formulation quite often yes. and obviously unbeknownst to the owner so I've had situations where people have called the company and they're like, oh, well, we actually changed that, that, you know, that brand, that type of food. So just check into that. One of the, um, the other non sort of, even no matter what the origin is, the other thing I would do is definitely give a probiotic because if it's allergy based or if it's infection based, most of um, the skin issues that I know of in dogs has been cleared up by probiotics. Wow, that's really cool. That's pretty much like our humans. Keep yeah. the intestinal tract clear, and it's amazing what you can do. That's right. That's right. Okay, well, our time is running away from us. we got a couple of more things to cover here. Okay. Um, this is... The um, one who asked you about is creating a good idea. And oh, yeah. I'm a huge advocate of creating. I think creating is a great idea. Um, you have to remember that um, crates to, you know, if you do really great crate training, meaning, you know, it's not a punishment, it's their space for safety, Yeah. then they love their crate. And I remember one of the smartest things my friend told me when I first got, and I now have a new, a new boy, and he's about three and a half, four years old. When I first got him and started creating him, and one is she said, remember that that's the safety. Not only is it his safety zone, but it's safe for him because the last thing you want is to leave the house and for them to chew or get into something that's dangerous. And so by him being in his crate, you're protecting him. And I think that was a really, I hadn't crate trained my first dog. She didn't need it. And so I think that was really good because I think as humans, we label it as being like almost in jail. You're like, oh my God, they're like confined. They don't have human contact. They can't move around. They're fine. But never use the crate as a punishment. Now, there are ways to make the crate more pleasurable. I mean, I used to put essential oils on a blanket in the crate so that, you know, to keep them calm. I would do a little lavender, like some people put lavender on their pillows. Right. I would put lavender on a dog blanket and or on toys, stuffed toys, and put them in the crate with that, you know, put them in the crate with it. This in the picture um, here is um, Marco. And Marco's one of my clients' um, work shepherds. She has a, he's purely like a work dog. And because he's a work dog, um, he does not sleep in the house with them. They have um, a heated area. They actually have a heated garage, and he sleeps in the garage in a crate. And he, but he has crate anxiety. But he is a work dog, so I guess they're very strict in the fact that you know he doesn't um, he doesn't have that comfort of a home like he's a work dog. So she called me and she asked me what to do, and so she's been applying a combination of essential oils that I gave her four times daily. And then she diffuses in front of the crate. 
every night. And she emailed me and texted me the other day, and she said all of a sudden it was like he was barking, and we couldn't understand. All night he was barking, she said. And we went downstairs like at like after about an hour, and she said the diffuser was off. Uh -huh. so he said they turned the diffuser on, and then they he did not make another peep the entire night. <laughs> That's great. So it's the gift of working with animals, too, though, is that they have no sort of interpretive, interpretive sort of like, does this work, does this not work mentality. Like, oil, oils are great like that when you put them on children and when you put them on pets because you put them on, they feel better. They don't sit there and say, I don't know if it works. They just feel good. You yeah. Know? So it's a really nice way to, that's what I love about working with animals. And so this is the book, in case you don't know, Spoil Your Pet. And in the book, we cover over 60 issues and how to address those is issues using essential oils. So some of them are just, you know, some of those ailments are just for cats and some are just for dogs and some apply to both. But the directions are very clear. We have little icons that navigate you through that if there's a picture or a cartoon of a cat, it means it's the cat directions and for a little icon for a dog, for the dog directions. And they're very clear as to um, um, how you should apply oils to dogs and cats. We have safety precautions and recipes. And then if anybody, um, which I would love, wants to connect further with us besides the book, because there's so much more and the book is great, but it's finite in one space, um, is either two Facebook pages. My company um, is Paws Path, A Healing Journey, and I work with people and their pets to create a better home and home life for both owner and pet and um, owner and animal and that's pause path and then the book has a Facebook page called spoil your pet and those are both Facebook pages and then um, if somebody wants to set up a consultation I do consultations and I, they can email me um, at jan at spoil your pet and um, lastly if you would like to purchase the book the book is available from aroma tools or Amazon. It's also available as an ebook as a, on Kindle and Nook. If you um, want to buy the books in bulk for some reason, if you want to buy it for a class or for a group or as gifts, you can contact me because I do offer bulk discount prices. And I'm having the next topic that I'll cover um, in our series will be allergies. And if you would like to um, have access to that webinar, you can email me and let me know, and I will then work with you to get access to that class. Wow, you have just been a wonderful fountain of information. And Jan, you know I have admired you for a long mm -hmm. time and your natural skill in working with pets. I love animals and they love me back, but I don't have the understanding that you have. And wow. we're so grateful you guys put this together. The book is so helpful. Even I understand it. That's why I'm very <laughs> excited about it. Oh, and, thank you. And I'm happy that you were willing to share your information. There were quite a few questions that came up on allergies, and I let people know that's going to be your next topic. And we will let people know how to register for the next class. Everyone who registered for this class, I have your email. So we will send you the link. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sue. I so appreciate it. And likewise, I am a huge, huge admirer of yours. And thank you guys so much for being willing to go easy, gentle. Remember, Jan kept saying less is more. A little bit goes a long way, right, Jan? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's so important. You can always reapply if you need, but you know, less is always more. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone. Your weekend. Happy Friday night. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. This is recorded, and we'll let you know how you can get a copy. Thank you.